Hello, I'm Cara Dahl Russell with our final installment of our After the News at Noon series, a series presented in recognition of Women's History Month, Courtly Love and the Cult of the Virgin. Once again, I'd like to remind you that if you're interested in finding out more, we've only been able to touch the tip of the iceberg of the information of what went on during this time period. My two major resources, the DVD series Civilization and the Learning Courses series The High Middle Ages by Dr. Philip Dayleader. I want to thank my Salisbury University practicum, Taylor Goebel, who specifically did work on some biographies that were incorporated into the scripts for this series, but also for doing a really nice setup on those resources to help you look under certain topics at a variety of websites for more information. Today, Clorinda, the Queen of the Shepherdesses. Doesn't ring a bell? Well, trust me, you have heard of her. We close out our series, Courtly Love and the Cult of the Virgin, with a persistent question. Yesterday, we mentioned that archaeologists and historians remain strongly skeptical of a real historical existence of a fertility goddess in religion. Another ongoing question is whether these stories of courtly love affected the lives of everyday women. Early on in the series, we mentioned a few legal set-asides for women that gave them a new, higher status. But we always have to remember that it is only a higher status than it had been previously, and the status of women before the year 1000 was abysmal. What we do know is that shortly after the year 1200, the backlash against Marian cults and heretical sects grew with increasing ferocity through more crusades, there were nine in all, and with renewed and much more harsh inquisitions. Despite this flowering in the position of women during these 200 years from 1,000 to 1,200, the next two to 300 years decimated most social gains for women and for the average person. Another thing that we do know is that the concept that one might marry for love, even against the wishes of family, is something that stuck in the popular consciousness a significant holdover from the stories of courtly love. The growth in the ideals of chivalry also kept a strong hold about new expectations that people with money, people with power, people in high office, do have a duty to think about and stand up for the welfare of those with less. Today we have smaller spans of time between societal movements, but in a similar reaction against an old ideal. By the 1600s, the feudal mindset and the repression of women had fully returned, including the burning of supposed witches. In the lifetime of Telamon and Bach, these poetic flourishes of courtly love were dismissed as childish. The church was dealing with the male-led, scholarship-dominated fight between factions and the schism of the early Protestants. As we mentioned in our first week, during the Romantic era, a time when the average person suddenly became interested in self-expression and the expression of emotions, all these love legends and courtly love stories had a resurgence, retold through the lens of the Romantic era and Victorian viewpoint. The Romantic era picked up the stories and used them as a springboard to justify their own self-absorbed focus on their own fine emotions and elaborated on the stories in literature, art, and music. Fine amour, or fine love, had returned, in a convenient version that returned the pedestal of veneration for beautiful young women while presenting older women as hags and witches. The idealized return to reinvigorated early love legends allowed these romantic artists to marry for love, to marry the object of their affections, And then, as she stepped off the pedestal into the daily grind of being a wife and mother in the 1800s, this same affinity for courtly love justified these men in their adultery, to view the wife as a crone, and to justify the deification of a new, younger, more lovely girl as their mistress and fine romance. The availability of print and growing media potential helped solidify these Romantic-era retellings as the real story, 
even if they were far removed from the original folk tales in many cases. The Arthurian tales flourished in retelling, as well as Tristan and Isolde, and many other folk tales that Wagner co-opted and reshaped for his operas. Wagner's patron, King Ludwig II of Bavaria, restyled himself as the Swan Prince. Even through the reign of Queen Victoria, there was a keen international sense that this generation was both inheriting a rich history and an equally strong feeling that this generation was creating history. This gave the generation the freedom to take the older stories, elaborate them, mold them, and blend them with their new educated ideas of what people could and should be, both individually and as countries. Perhaps the most straightforward examples of the retellings are the stories we now know as Robin Hood and Marion. It is thought that the first mention of these characters is actually not British, but French. A French madrigal song or pastoral play circa 1280, Jeu du Robin et Marion, the play of Robin and Marion, presents a peasant maid, Marion, who resists the seduction of a traveling knight in favor of her rustic boyfriend, Robin. In some of these tellings, she calls herself Clorinda, Queen of the Shepherdesses, to the point that the dissimilar names Clorinda and Marion became interchangeable. While these madrigals and pastoral plays are distinct from the English legends that crop up in the 1400s, these characters, as well as Friar Tuck, became closely associated with May Day festivities. What is important to notice is that in these original songs, Lady Marion is simply a shepherdess, a peasant girl. So early on, one of the essential elements of this story is that shocking and unthinkable idea of peasants marrying for love. It is also worth noticing the flow from French song to English story, the same path taken by chivalric tales and courtly love songs. Our image of Robin Hood today as the cheerful and high-minded freedom fighter comes from Romantic era incarnations, notably Sir Walter Scott's Ivanhoe of 1819 and the work of a French author, Augustin Thierry's 1825 History of the Conquest of England by the Normans. It was in these stories that Maid Marian, notice the synonym for Virgin Mary, Maid Marian is suddenly a lady of rank. She has been promised in marriage to a noble who is unworthy. We suddenly have concepts of nobility being something separate from class or rank, and that the peasant Robin Hood is of worthy character and a preferable match for a lady of nobility. Romance now is a vehicle for the recognition of proletariat human rights, courtesy of the Romantic era writers. So while we have no historical proof that stories of courtly love affected the lives of everyday people when they first appeared, what we can see is a progression over time. The persistent influence of stories of courtly love and the cult of the Virgin.